So, hey everyone. So we're going to uh, go into our final keynote of the day. There's a funny story here. Uh, we thought we were going to be clever and do like a surprise keynote, and then I check on Twitter, and then it's like the not so surprise keynote. So I don't know if we were just a <laughs> bad security conference. Like we're not good at security, or you guys are too good. I'm going to try to go for the latter so that we can save ourselves a little bit. But uh, as you guys already know, <laughs> OPSEC, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to present uh, Wolfgang Gorlick, and he will be talking about following the rules. Everyone should do that, maybe. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. You guys all hear me OK? I love the mic. I love the podium. But I pace, so I might go off. I apologize. I'll speak nice and loud. Yeah, this talk is, is following the rules, right? That's why we're all hackers, right? We like to follow rules and be told what to do. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, my name's Wolf. And a little bit about me. I uh, love B-Sides. I was involved with B-Sides Detroit up until this year as one of the organizers. Huge fans of the B-Sides movement, so really excited to be out here in Charleston. Uh, I also do an apprenticeship program. I'm uh, uh, responsible for an apprenticeship program in CBI, uh, which is my employer. We've put around 60, 70 people through it now. It's a two-year program where people come in and get trained and get mentored, get coached. And at a point in time where everyone's like, we can't find people, we got, on average, 55 people for every one person we let in that program. So it's a real cool group of folks that get into that. Uh, and then my day job is I'm on the defense. Uh, so I've got a, a peer who's in the pen test. And we will go into a meeting and people are like, he's a red teamer. He's the Yoda of information security. He once broke into the Pentagon, ladies and gentlemen. And everyone's like, yeah. And then I come in next and they're like, yeah, and there's Wolf and, and he has spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he's, he, he tries to stop the, yeah. So I, a lot of this is, from the defensive perspective today that I'm going to be covering. Uh, but really stems back from this fact that in information security, we are moving towards professionalizing what we do, right? It's become a profession. A lot of us gray beards like myself, we started when it was a hobby. I remember getting on BBSs going, I want to get in. What do I do? And they're like, you need to get sys, uh, admin, and, and root. And I'm like, yes, what is that? And they're like, I don't know, but you need to get it. I will get the sysadmin. Uh, what do you do? You run just through trash. Okay, I don't want to do that. But you know, you, you got in in the ground floor, and none of us knew what we we're doing, and there were no rules. And today, a lot of folks are coming out of the university and going into my apprenticeship program. A lot of folks are coming out of the school system, and they're coming in to the the very organizations I'm consulting with, I'm advising with, and we've sort of like cemented. This, this layer of rules that people are supposed to follow. And that's what I want to poke some fun at today because I think that's really dangerous. Because you better believe that the bad guys don't follow the rules, right? Why, why are we? So the way this talk is set up is like this. I'm going to say, here's a rule. They tell us we need to talk about technology, not risk. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And I'm going to be like, yeah, but uh, why the hell are we doing this? Here's where it constrains us. Here's where it causes problems. Here's the issues. All right, cool. From the defensive side, red teamers can mock me all they want because we all know red teamers will, and they'll flip over the table and we'll go, ah, damn you red teamers, I'll lock the table down next time. <laughs> so let's start with that. Let's start with this concept that we're supposed to talk risk. This is like embedded in so many different university programs today. It's like CISO 101, don't talk about the technology, talk about risk. And I do love risk. I love the game. You're here. Here be monsters. Uh, we will protect the eastern seaboard. Uh, but part of the concept of risk management always comes back to this idea of risk appetite. Have you guys heard this? We've got we to gotta know an organization's risk appetite so we can define their security. And I love that question because you go and you ask like, the CEO, hey, hey what's, what's your risk appetite? And they're like, hi, we're in business to take risk. And you're like, oh, OK, that's not really helpful, but all right. You ask the CFO, and it's always like to the penny, $9,875,067 to the last quarter. That's our risk appetite. Like, all right. That kind of tells me how much I should spend on my security budget, I guess. The CIO is like, keep the lights on, no risk, don't do anything scary, keep the lights on. Please don't pen test my mainframe or touch any of my systems. And by the way, who are you again, and should you even be in here, right? Sale. 
Yes, bourbon or uh, a CI, CISO, right? Yes, because CISO, what the risk appetite is? Bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> it's my risk appetite. Um, and that's the one problem that starts with this whole issue is that we, we have this idea that we need to talk risk, but no one really has a clue what risk means. And if you're a young person, you're like, that's a risk because you can run Responder. And they're like, you shouldn't talk technology. That's a risk because you can get passwords. Well, we don't really care because everything's, no, but that's, and it creates this weird cycle where we actually don't solve any issues. Moreover, there's, there's a bigger problem when you start figuring out what the real risks are. Uh, for example, rhinos. Uh, seems like a weird segue, but bear with me. In, in, in France a couple years ago, maybe you guys heard the story. In France a couple years ago, there's this beautiful rhino, and they got the rhino, and uh, they, they had them over here in a cage, and they had a moat about this big, and they had a fence about this tall, and people sat over here and went, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a beautiful rhino. And that was a day at the Paris Zoo. That was the case for about a month. About a month, the zoo had this rhino. After a month, the rhino got killed, sadly, by poachers. And when I saw this, I, I, it boggled my mind. I'm like, that's something that's supposed to happen in like a third world country. You are in Paris, man. Get some wine and some good food. Why are you messing around? with a rhino. Uh, and, I, and I started digging into this and trying to figure out what was going on because, you know, they had a moat and they had a fence. It should be fine. Why are you messing around with a rhino? When you actually did the math on this rhino, it was a little bit over a million dollars, that horn, a million dollars. Now, if you think about a zoo and you say, I'm going to give you a million dollars in gold coin right here, do you think they're going to have a moat and a fence about that big? No. No, they're absolutely not, because they're going to treat that as a completely different risk. Number two problem with risks is we think about it as the nice animal that we're all here to see, not what's in it for the criminals, right? And what's in it for the criminals is oftentimes abstracted from what the business is seeing, which is why the CISO says bourbon, and the CIO says, you know, don't keep the lights on, and the CEO, everyone's got their own perspective, and it's oftentimes not, oh, I've got a million dollars in rhino horn right there. It's not the way we think. So, back to the game of risk, this has some really strong implications. We set up all our pieces to protect Europe, right? I'm going to save that rhino horn. <laughs> and we've got all our pieces around and everything's good and we see our parameters and we see our perimeters and we see our borders and we're like, yes, this is fantastic. And this is the defensive view. However, the attackers see a completely different game. Same pieces but completely different parameters, completely different edges. If you guys sat in the red team talks today, you heard that. Here's how we see the network. Here's how we see um, Active Directory. Here's how we see Bloodhound to map it through. Bloodhound is not what our Active Directory admins are seeing, right? They're like, oh, I'm domain admin, and we put everything in domain admin because that works. No, no, it's two completely different games. And that is the next problem. We are fundamentally, at any given point in time, putting the same pieces on two different boards because one of them is the way the business works and the other one is the way the criminals work. And the difference between whether or not we protect that rhino horn is whether or not we have the piece at the right place at the right time, and hopefully we do until they change the board. Problem number two, no one knows the real likelihood or probability of an event. When we talk about risk management, we all get excited about it, very difficult to do. I do a ton of risk management or risk assessments in my organization, we do something like 50 a year. And uh, before then, I was a CISO of a financial services firm, so companies would come out and do risk assessments on me, and we'd always come up with these great reports. And they'd be like, your risk is somewhere between high and whining. And I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> and down here's blank stare, which is my favorite category of risk. It's a but you the, get these weird charts, and you're like, what the hell does it even mean? And yet we're supposed to act on that and build security around it. Risk management sounds really exciting and really fun, until you actually go ahead and do it. That's a problem. Another thing we're taught from a very young age, right? 101 class, what do the criminals want? Intellectual property, they're out here to steal our data, right? This is what they want. And yet, oftentimes I'll go into organizations, I'll have a very similar conversation. I'm like, hey, what, what's your intellectual property? I was working with a cabinetry company, a cabinetry company, they built cabinets. I'm like, what intellectual property do you have? And they're like, a cabinet company. What do you mean? If people want to steal cabinets, they'll go to the place that you buy the cabinets and they'll like measure them 
and there goes our intellectual property. We have no intellectual property. So oftentimes, I'm like, what's your sense of data we need to protect? They're like, we don't have any. And the SSC is they're like, yeah, this is why we drink. <laughs> 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 We're stuck in this trap, right? Uh, but we know there's rhino horns out there. We know that cybercrime is a thing. Cybercrime is reported to be $3 trillion annually, $3 trillion every single year, made by criminals defrauding us, doing terrible things with our data. Um, and, and so if you start piecing that out, that gives us some better visibility into how high we need the fences to be and how wide we need the moats to be. Intellectual property, of course, number one, half trillion dollars every single year, stolen blueprints, stolen plans, um, you name it, right? Stolen patents. Next one, of course, as you might imagine, is credit cards intellect or in your health information. Um, 160 billion. This has actually dropped, and this is one of the things that's kind of interesting about cybercrime. This used to be like the number one way, right? I would steal someone's credit cards, and then I would make all the money. Do you guys know what killed that? Why it dropped? No, before that. They already had it, right? Target happened. Home Depot happened. How many times have your credit cards been stolen? I mean, the credit card value went from like, you can make $300 on a stolen credit card to like 10. I'll give you 10 maybe for that because maybe I can like charge 15 bucks and that work, right? Same thing with health information. The minute an anthem went, it went, vroom, crash. So you do that math, three trillion minus those things. There's a little bit left. <laughs> Criminals might still be doing some other stuff. And usually when I put this slide up there, everyone's like, I know what it is. I know what it is. I have the answer. Ransomware. Because we hear about ransomware all the time, right? This is like one of the top things customers ask me before like, hey, can you get the pen tester in here because he's the cool guy. I'm like, yeah, okay. Second th top thing, can you, can you help me protect against ransomware? Why ransomware? Because I heard it in the news. We have this thing called security by volume, right? And I don't mean like water volume. That would be kind of cool maybe, I guess. So just flood everything and then we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> no, I mean security by how loud the media is yelling. That's really how tuned we are to risk. What do you hear about all the time? Ransomware, so it must be ransomware. Check out the stat though. Ransomware last year, $1 billion. Three trillion total, only one billion went to ransomware. When I was researching this talk, I, I pulled down a whole bunch of reports and everything. Kaspersky had some good numbers and it really surprised me because ransomware actually fell by a third. It fell by a third. At the same time, everyone's still freaking out about ransomware. It fell by a third. One of the reasons is, of course, it's becoming harder to get people to pay and people are starting to have backups and God forbid they actually protect their data that's happening somewhere I hear. Uh, and still, criminals are like, wait a minute, if this is hard and we're doing all this work to get Cryptocurrency, how can we get the cryptocurrency quicker? So, of course, as you might imagine, crypto mining is what's on the uptick. I've got a good friend who does web hosting, and he found uh, Monero. If you guys are familiar with Monero, it's like the, the prime way to do crypto mining now. Bitcoin is, is too hard for, uh, for the criminals. Monero, you can put in a browser. It's great. He found Monero. People had used Apache flaws, sprayed Monero all over his web farms, and something like $1.6 million dollars was in stolen wallets running off web front ends in this data center. Oh, that's cool. You should keep that. He's like, no, no, I can't. Turn it off. I'm like, good. You're ethical. That's great. <laughs> so what was the wallets? He wouldn't tell me. But anyways, so crypto mining, right? That is going up 44%. Kind of interesting. So ransomware and crypto mining are going to do something like this. And maybe it'll hit about a billion, maybe two billion. We'll see what shakes out of this. Still a lot of money left. One of the primary ways that I'm seeing attacked, or I see my clients attacked today, is actually invoice fraud. You guys are probably well familiar with wire fraud. Hi, I'm the CEO, please transfer me money. And someone's like, oh, they're the CEO, here's our money. That is, has been going on forever. Wire fraud is a thing, but invoice fraud is on the uptick. Here's the way it works. Um, I, I steal your creds, okay? Somehow I've gotten into your Office 365 email, I fished you or whatever, and I'm gonna set up rules. And those rules are gonna be whenever I email you, you're gonna forward it on. And whenever they reply back, you're gonna send it to me. And then you're gonna delete it so you don't see it, all right? So now I'm gonna email you, and you're gonna send it to you. And you'll be like, oh, that's my, my email from Jim. 
hi, Jim, how's it going? Boom. You see it, forward it back to me, delete it. I'm like, hi, I'm Jim. How's it going, right? And we start a conversation that way. They've been targeting accounts payable folks. I've seen this all over in my manufacturing customers. And then what they say is, oh, by the way, you may be interested to know that I've got this brand new Acme billing site that has all your invoices. You're like, oh, that's great. Comes up to me, all I need to know is, what do, what do you owe me so I'm right, so I can reconcile? You're like, oh, here's what I show. Great. Now, here's the thing. If you pay now, I'll give you 10% off. This here. How many clients are going to fall for that? If your account's payable person, you want to be the person at the end of the month that said, I saved the company a million dollars. I am a hero. So people do, and they pay all this money, and then the company gets defrauded several millions of dollars. Very interesting attack. This is the point on the slide where I love to give you a great statistic of how many billions of dollars that's happening. But I don't have one. I can't find one. And that is really interesting to me. Two trillion dollars, remember, is unaccounted for. So why is there no stats in this? We get called in all the time to investigate these things. One of the reasons is, if you're compromised for this, you couldn't tell anybody? Oh, by the way, I totally lost, um, you know, your payments. Nope. As a matter of fact, New York Times did a survey and they found that only about one in 10 crimes is actually reported. One in 10 crimes. So, we're all panicking about ransomware because that's what everyone's yelling about. We're all worried about intellectual property, if we have any. And we're all told to like worry about crime, but yet most crime we have no idea what it is. About two thirds of it, no clue. What we're even defending against. Most of it goes unreported, unknown. Scary thought, scary thought. And really big hole in how we go about doing security. But anyway, guys are thinking, don't worry about it, Wolf, don't worry about it. All we need to do is secure it like a castle. We'll just build walls around our organization, tall walls, thick, para or thick walls, parapet, another moat, we're good, right? Secure it like a castle is like the quintessential way we're taught to do cybersecurity, just need a castle. I'm going to build a firewall. What am I going to do? I'm going to use a castle. I'm going to build my website. What am I going to do? I'm going to do a castle. I'm going to do Hadoop. This one makes no sense to me. Hadoop's in the cloud. It's okay. We're going to build a castle. I don't get that one. But at the same time, we've been talking about building castles forever. We've been talking about building data centers forever, right? And we all know data centers are like on the way out. But I think there's some really good like... Uh, crossover there because you take a long time to build a data center. You take a lot of money to build a data center. Similar with the castle. This castle is Harlech Castle. This castle is in Wales. It's considered by many to be like the prime example of a medieval castle. Really great defenses that stood the test of time. Some interesting things about this castle is when they were building it, it took 10% of the revenue of the entire kingdom to build that castle. Those of you in defense, please raise your hand if you have 10% of the company's revenue. <laughs> and, and I've got the band. I, I am looking for a job. So no, no. Generally, a gardener says we get 0.2% of IT security spend. And usually when I put that up, someone's like, I wish I had 0.2%. Right? We don't have the money for castles. We love our castles. But there's no way we have the money for it. Problem number one. Back to France for a minute, back to our rhinos. This site in France is really freaking cool. What they're doing is, and it started in 1997, uh, and I hate giving out years because now that my, my apprenticeship model has grown and people are like, there's always that person going, I was born in 1997, I'm like, you stop talking. <laughs> so for those of you who may have been born in 1997, congratulations, thank you for being in cybersecurity. We need you, but for a minute, don't make me feel old. They, they're building an entire castle by hand, by scratch. They're like dragging the stone up. They're crushing the stone. They've got like hatchets to make the wood. They're doing this as a archeological project to figure out how castles were built. Really freaking cool. They got 50 expert craftsmen working on this and they figure it's gonna take about 25 years to build and about 10 million to, to, to construct. They're learning a ton, ton. And you can go, you can visit. There it is, you Google it. When you're in France, go see it. Don't see the zoo. There's nothing in the zoo anymore. All right. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but this also gives me hope for all the rest of us graybeards. This is our, my retirement plan. I'm looking for 50 expert craftsmen to help me build data centers. Anyone's interested? <laughs> Send me an email. We have tours. We'll show the kids this is a hot aisle, this is a cold aisle. It'll be great. <laughs> But think about the way we build data centers and think about the way we build castles and think about the way we build infrastructure. It's all this waterfall model, right? Here is my three-year plan that I'm going to construct something. And here's my revenue associated with it and my full-time employees. At the same time, we cling to this waterfall model in cybersecurity and in IT operations. Application development, of course, has went way to agile. Smaller loops, feature functionality implement, feature functionality implement. When I was doing DevOps back at a financial company, I thought it was really, really cool when I got to a month and we were like calling the press and we had a white paper on it and my smiling picture was in it. I thought it was cool. And so then I'm sitting down with my friends and they're like, we do DevOps. I'm like, it's great. What's your velocity? They're like, once every four hours. What the hell? What did you guys do? And at the same time, once every four hours, they're changing the environment. We're being asked to build a castle around that, not knowing where it's gonna be in a week, let alone a month, let alone a year. That's the next problem with castle building. It just takes too long, specifically given the pace of modern IT infrastructure. I would put forth the following definition of security. Security is not castle building anymore. It's not high walls, it's not strong doors. Security is bells on strings. Strings rolled from one side to the other and bells that ring when attackers are moving across your network following a given path. That is a great way of doing security. And I say that and people are like, that's great. Once we have the strings, we can put weights on and we can do defense and death. <laughs> because that's the other thing we're all taught about, right? I've got, I love, I love it when folks come in and they're working with me and they're fresh out of college and they look at this environment and they're like, we can solve them. We just need to do defense and death. I'm like, that's great. How are you going to afford it? They're like, I don't know. You, you worry about that. Here's what we need. And the flip side, too, is what's always exciting is when you talk to a CISO or a CIO, not a CISO, they know better, a CIO, and you're like, what's your defense in depth, right? And I do a lot of these risk assessments, so that's where you start with. You start an interview, sit down with a, a stakeholder, and you're like, hey, how good is your defense in depth? And they go, oh, we spend a lot, it takes a lot of time. Our defense in depth is deep. They're like, and it's littered with the bones of our enemies. <laughs> And I'm like, all right, this just got dark, but okay, <laughs> noting bones of our enemies. Um, but then we bring in our pen testers. And anyone who's on the red team knows what we're going to find. The defense in depth is more like this, right? <laughs> and you're like, what happened? What, why? You guys, you guys were awesome. What, I heard such great things in the interviews. So if we jump back to risk for a minute, for those of you guys who have played risk, you probably recognize, right, you can attack the places that you're touching, and it's a numbers game. If you've got three guys defending and you've got six people attacking, you're likely to win. Numbers game. This is defense in depth. I've got my defenses evenly distributed across my entire environment. And if you're designing a network, you'd be like, this is good because we don't want a crunchy perimeter and a chewy center. We want defense in depth. Um, but, but if you were to take those same defenses and put them on the perimeter or otherwise design it right where the attack is going to go, you're gonna be much more successful. If you focus on where the attacker really is, you can build a good defense. It's not defense in depth. And when you go to do that, someone's gonna go, oh, we got all this weakness over here. Look, anyone could attack Eastern United States and did you hear about the caravan? No, forget about the caravan. The United States is fine. We can focus our defenses, right? But no one wants to focus defenses at the senior level. And at the junior level, you're like, but I was told defense in depth. I wanna spend everything. And it's not like, you know, the people who may have a magic quadrant don't encourage this. If you talk to the magic quadrant folks, they're like, here is our security, here's what we're gonna do. It's really simple, I just need you to buy one of everything, and then we've got expense in depth, right? <laughs> I, have, I have three sims, I am clearly protecting my environment, it is all good. I've, I like to think about security more like, balloon tower defense <laughs> and if anyone wants to spend like the next week playing balloon tower defense and their boss is like what are you doing you can be like, I was at a security conference and they told me this is security I'm playing <laughs> I promise you can get away with that but if you imagine this the red is the attackers okay and they're following the attack path through the network 
Someone is always going to miss. There's always going to be a miss, oftentimes multiple misses. But if you actually layer on the defenses along that attack path, you can have multiple chances to get that, right? You can have my AV be only 60% effective, and I can have my guys who click fishing only be 25% effective, and 75% they click things. You can have this if you have defenses along those, that path. And this is the beauty, I think, of threat modeling. You can take, any, take a kill chain, take an attack path, take whatever framework you want, but layer on the entire path that that balloon's going to take and say, there be monkeys. I'm going to stop them here. I'm going to stop them there, right? I can't stop them everywhere. But where could I put those monkeys? A few times during this conference, I've heard the words MITRE attack framework. A few times I'm assuming you guys have as well. MITRE attack framework today is the way that I think about these things. I look at that path that they are taking and I lay it across MITRE attack framework and I say, what are the real tactics they're using? What are those tactics that are being performed? And once I know those tactics, I get people in the room from that organization and I say, okay, how can we add some prevention? How can we add some detection? How can we increase the time? This book is Time-Based Security, Winshore 2. Um, great, great book. Very fundamental, I think, in how you do cybersecurity. And his whole thought was this. Security is defined as follows. It is secure if the time it takes to breach the prevention is longer than time to detect and respond. Time it takes you to break in the house takes you longer than the alarm system to go off and the police to arrive, you're secure. You got a fireproof safe and it burns for eight hours, um, but it's rated at 10, your contents are safe, right? That's security right there. If you can figure out ways to drive up the prevention, how long it takes the detector to, to thwart that, and drive down the detection, how quickly you can get to them, you're in a secure state. And if you look at that path and you start doing that, you can lay out monkeys. I think of a five plus two strategy. If I can stop five tactics twice, detect and prevent, I'm probably in a pretty good state. And it's a hell of a lot cheaper than buying one of everything. So that's the next problem. Defense in depth sounds great, but without a clear use case, it's expensive. It's expensive, expensive, and it always has gaps. And when we think about how oftentimes pen testers break in, it's those gaps that they're following. The next one we hear all the time is don't do checkbox security, right? Don't just check the box. We got to really be compliant. Everyone's afraid to check the box for some reason. I don't know why. But it's not like you're usually compliant with one thing. There's like a bazillion things that people have to be compliant with these days, right? And then they just keep adding GDPR now, CCPA next. Who knows what's coming after it? And the answer is usually just, no problem. We'll build a roadmap, which, again, you might remember is kind of like waterfall. If we just have three years, we can be completely secure and just throw a bunch of money in it. Unfortunately, there's only so much money. Unfortunately, there's only so many monkeys. Uh, and so how do we spend that money and how do we position those monkeys really determines whether they're secure. Back to software development for a, a moment. You guys have probably heard MVP, minimum viable product. And I love that concept for security. If you think about minimum viable architecture, what's the minimum that we can put in place to satisfy the requirements and check those boxes? And then, and then here's a crazy thought. If we use attack framework or other detective methods, what if we were to get feedback when those controls were touched, were triggered, were used, right? What if we can lay out the compliance and every time someone trips over something, we can go, hey, that's pretty weird. I checked that PCI box, but three times in a row, Frank bypassed MFA. And they go, ha, huh, I can invest in MFA. Or I checked that checkbox. And you know what? The MFA is really crappy, but no one has ever tried to steal passwords from that. Never, not going to happen. But you know what I'm saying? Kind of an interesting way to just like flip it on its head. So problem there is blind compliance is just as bad as defense in depth. And we always say, don't just check the box, but make it <clears throat> to 11 each one. We end up spending a lot more than we can actually afford. Probably the, the quintessential like bumper sticker for rules that get people in trouble, though, as, as I think, is the one do not do security through obscurity. The actual rule for this makes a lot of sense. If I've got a path to where the bad guys are going, don't just hide stuff because that's going to be easy to circumvent. But people take that to the nth degree. I had a very long argument one time 
was someone who was bound to be determined to put SSH on the internet. And I'm like, all right, we can do SSH on the internet, but why don't we change the port? It's you and two guys going to, no, we can't change the port. Why not? That would be security through obscurity, and I know that's bad. I'm like, I'm not trying to trick you, bro. Scanners are looking for SSH. But if we move it, isn't that giving up? No, it's putting in a good control so the scanners don't get to you. Ah, and I've had similar arguments. Um, did you guys see uh, Tom's talk at, at uh, was it 9 o'clock, where he mentioned how like Qualys users are always like Qualys user, and like admin ability, scanning the full network, you name it Qualys if it's a Qualys user. And so Red Team knows to look for the Qualys user. I was talking to a company who was doing that, and I'm like, why don't we name that something else? Like Voldemort. Well, that would be security through obscurity. I'm like, yes. And then when they pulled on our user accounts, they're not going to go, there's the Qualys account. I'll steal that cred. No one's going to want the Voldemort account. Come on. <laughs> Probably won't even say the name out loud. <laughs> so this, this is one of the fundamental problems of this idea of security through obscurity. Good obscurity adds time to circumvent the prevention. It makes it more difficult for the determined attacker. Good obscurity increases the likelihood of detection, especially if you have Voldemort as the account and Qualys is just an account that no one uses until someone tries to use it. You're like, ha! No one to use that. You use it. You are the bad guy. Done. Right? Drop the net. It's a way of slowing down that determined attacker by confusing them. If you hear like red team horror stories, it's usually the obscurity. Oh man, you have no idea. They had your computers all named with numbers. And I'm like, what the hell? And they had these service accounts and they were named after artists. And I'm like, I can't even, I can't even right now. And I'm trying to map this out and the maps won't form. That is good obscurity because it really pisses them off and slows them way down. Um, now, the thing about determined attackers, though, in most organizations, in most organizations, that's not what we face. Most of the time, about 90% of the, 7% of the time, across the organizations I work with, it's not the determined attacker. It's not the hoodie guy with the superpowers. It is some malware, right? Now, that's not always the case. I recently hired a guy from the energy sector, and I was talking through this, and he sat way back, and I went, what? He goes, no. Nah. Russia really is out to get us. I'm like, yeah, but you're an energy. I mean, like for the cabinet makers, guys, it's usually just some malware that's spraying around. So quick story of, of mine, back in the day, back in the day, used to install Citrix, um, Citrix Metaframe, now Zenframe or whatever, and you install it to a funky letter, right? You install it to like M for Metaframe. It was clever. Uh, and then when people logged in, they would map their C drive to the actual C drive so they could browse their files. And I never thought about this as a security control 10 years ago. But we got hit with some malware from one of our partners because they're on a, a network and it jumped the network. So we get hit with all this malware and it's scanning around our network and I had no idea. What I did know was suddenly we're getting pop-ups that an executable failed. Well, that's weird. Why would an executable be failing? And come to find out the malware was hard-coded to write to the C drive and it wasn't on the C drive. Windows wasn't on the C drive. It crashed. It got past our IPS, it got past our IDS, it got past our endpoint AV, changed the drive alert, it's done, killed it, completely prevented our, us from being infected. Whereas my partner who was connected to us, oh, they were down for days. Kind of interesting, kind of interesting. And I've heard other similar people go, hey, did you notice when malware is like in a sandbox, it can't run? I'm like, yeah. It's like, you know what I did? I go, what'd you do? And he was like, I found the registry keys it's looking for and I pushed those to all my Windows endpoints. Like, that is brilliant. Malware infects the box, he looks, he goes, oh, I'm in a sandbox, shut down, be quiet. And it's on like the secretary's machine. Ah, life is good, right? Obscurity, a little bit of obscurity is really a lot of fun because you feed a bot bad malware and a bot does what software always does with bad input. It dies. And then we're protected and then we're safe. So, problem. Find that clever bumper sticker, like, oh, don't do obscurity has actually caused much more problems. It prevents us from finding some really cool, clever hacks that we can deploy. All right, next one is, and this one drives me nuts. We have a talent shortage. You guys hear this? We need somewhere between one and a billion people to solve the InfoSec problem. Numbers may vary, but I think it's one to a billion. Um, look, before I tackle that, one more thing about castles. Castles, and knights, right? Back in the good old days, there was a percentage, 
generally around the time of Harlock Castle that worked something like this. For every 200 people, you had about one knight. And for every one knight, you had like five archers supporting them. That was the number. That was about the number the English had when they were fighting the French, give or take, you know, percentage here or there. Similarly, we can slice and dice with IT folks. This number comes from Gartner. Um, one infosec professional for every 1,000 employees. One infosec professional for every 20 IT pros. Kind of scary when you think about it. Kind of scary because that means 20 people are doing who knows what, who knows where, who knows why, probably with admin rights, at any given point in time, and you get one infosec guy like, wait, guys, can you slow down? Think of what you're doing. Those numbers kind of paint a bleak picture. But, you know, it's just castles, it's knights, and we all know good uh, metaphors are hard to find. When you go and look at what CISO says, they say, hey, we got 0% unemployment. When you go to look at like information security, they're like, yeah, we can't find anybody. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that my program has 55 qualified applicants for every one person I hire. And I bet you a bunch of guys here are looking to get into uh, information security, and a bunch of people who are in it are looking to move up. How can that be? How can we turn away 54 people but have 0% unemployment? Doesn't quite make sense. Something is not adding up. Part of the problem is this concept of, and you, I'm sure you guys have heard this, if I only could clone myself, you know, if only I had like one more of me, risky, risky thinking. A, I would never want to clone myself because I would not want to work with that guy. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. It, it breeds this mentality that talent must look like me, right? And a lot of us who are in information security just sort of like ended up here. It just seemed fun at the time. And now people come up to goes, you've been doing this for two decades. I'm like, oh, I have. But it, we didn't start out that way. So why are we looking for people like us? It doesn't make sense. The other thing is, is that human mind is inherently flawed, right? The, the, the flaws in the animal brain are fantastic and phenomenal. We have things like the choice support bias. Whatever I chose was the right choice. That's what my brain tells me. It must be true. You have things like the like me bias. If there are people are like me, and studies have shown this again and again, if someone looks like you or you look like your boss, your boss rates you higher, you get raises faster, you get promoted quicker. Weird, weird. And I don't even look like my boss, which is why I need a raise. Uh, performance bias, same thing, right? If we think people are like us, we rate them higher. So think about what this is doing at the moment. I talked about this, this cementing of what it means to be an infosec as we turn into a profession. We're getting to this point where like hackers, I know how to hire hackers. This was a quote someone told me. I have no problem hiring hackers because hackers look like hackers. <laughs> what the hell, dude? We got into this thinking hackers are weird, right? It's, it's a, it's a uh, meritocracy. The smartest idea wins. Hackers are strange. We're people with the mohawks and the flamethrowers. We're, we're the people who go to like the wall of China and realize we don't have any money and con our way down onto the back of a, you know, there's some weird stories with hackers. But this idea that hackers look like hackers concerns me because we've solidified in our mind what that means. And at the same time, we're embracing all this weirdness. Whenever someone is not weird like the way we think a hacker is, suddenly they don't belong, right? Suddenly they don't, shouldn't be in the room. Suddenly we shouldn't listen to them. Suddenly, why are they at our conference? I think that's so scary and so terrifying, right? Hacker diversity, diversity, inclusion, hacker style should mean finding weird, finding the new weird, finding the weird weird. Not the guy with the mohawk. We, we can hire him. That seems cool. But I mean, what about the person without a mohawk? What the person who looks normal and likes to wear a suit? What if it's a woman? What if it's, you name it. Finding new and exciting folks, right, that can change the status quo is so paramount right now in a day and age where we say we can't find anybody. Because I can tell you, there's tons of people who want in, we're just not talking to them. Because they don't look like a hacker. So that's problem number one. We don't have a, a talent shortage, we've got a hiring problem. We have a hard time hiring people who are different and unique. Problem number two, uh, I'm mentoring some people right now from a local university, and one of my mentees sits down, mentees, mentos, I always want to say mentos. Like, one of my mentos sits down, I'm the Diet Coke. No, but. <laughs> He sits down with me and he, he tells me about this interview. He wants me to help him interview. I'm like, why do you need help interviewing? I'm a terrible person. I don't interview anyone great. I'm sitting down like, hey, you look cool. You want to go on an adventure? And they're like, yes. I'm like, you're hired. Terrible interview. <laughs> what, what do you mean? He goes, well, here's what happened. He went into an interview. He sat down, all excited. He has his tie on, suit coat. It's all good. 
And uh, he had waited in the conference room for like 20 minutes. And the hiring manager comes in, this, this surly looking like uh, IT guy, and comes and sits down with him. He's like, we're going to start with the technical questions first because this is a hard job. All right, sure. And he's like, tell me, what's the difference between Telnet and SSH? And the guy didn't know. It was an information assurance degree. He was taught compliance. He had no idea. He's like, I, HS, SS what? No clue. And you know what happened? The hiring manager's like, all right, thank you very much. Packs up his stuff. Goes, you, you can see the door. The HR uh, people will contact you. Yep, ask one question and show them the door. How bad is that? Jeez. And that had me thinking about skills, right? The skills that we used to value. And I was joking a little bit about the data center back in the day, but I used to love building data centers. And I'm going to brag because I can show this slide only for probably like another year before no one cares ever. But this was my data rack. Isn't that pretty wiring? I had some really, thank you, thank you. I thank you. <laughs> I had some really pretty wiring. We did our entire cabinet this way. It was beautiful. I could find everything. And at the time, I could tell you, like, it was a QL 2340 fiber channel card, and I knew the name of the firmware and everything. I loved this data center. Loved it. And, and yet, it, it kind of makes me want to be like, well, if you can't do that, should you even be an InfoSec, bro? Should you even be an InfoSec? It had me thinking about when I was a young man and my, my uh, father and his, my uncles, my grandfather gave me a lot of grief because I'm terrible at working on a car. Can't change a spark plug, can't really change my oil. I probably could figure it out, but why? I'm like, why, why are you guys giving me all this grief? I can take it to someone and they will do this for me. That's the way, there's people who do this now. I'm like, no, you need to know this. And it, it wasn't until I was a little bit older that it occurred to me why that was. When they were my age, all the good jobs in Michigan, I'm from Detroit, so all the good jobs in Michigan were manufacturing. And if you couldn't work on your car, you were not gonna get a good job. And they were so concerned that I didn't know the mechanics. And a light bulb went on, because I'm like, that's exactly what I'm thinking about, because I'm like, oh, you don't know what SSH is. You don't know what a fiber card is, right? I think the real talk is, to us graybeards is, is the skills that we needed to get here are not the skills that the young people in this room are gonna need to get there. And we got to remember that when we're bringing people in. So vitally important. And then when we hire them, this is great. We bring out the young people and like, how do you do your job? I'm like, just do it. <laughs> and if you haven't seen the SNL skit where the IT guy's like, move, you guys should. Google it. You'll enjoy it. This is our attitude, right? Oh, you can't do it. Move out of my way, kid. What, what's going on? There's very little apprenticeship programs. There's very little mentoring. There's very little coaching. We just expect folks to know it. And we have a real hard time today bridging that gap of college to professional. So that problem number two is we don't have a talent shortage. We have plenty of talent. Talent all over the place. Talent in here. Talent everywhere. We've got a skill shortage. We've got a training problem. We've got a mentoring and coaching problem. All right? And it's okay. It's not like we have an ego or anything, which reminds me of my next point. We can't patch stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah hear that all the time. <laughs> right. Here's someone back there going, amen. Thank you. <laughs> and then the, you got the great bumper sticker like, don't click it, right? You know? Yeah. In, in, a, in a building, in a building um, that uh, my wife used to live in, um, there was this problem, right? The elevator wasn't stopping on the right floor. And uh, people were getting hurt. People were getting hurt. And at one point in time, it stopped like too low. And you walked in, and you like fell, right? and cut yourself. And so there's blood and everywhere, and she's sending me photos and whatnot. And she reports this to the property manager. And people report this to the property manager again and again and again. And they fixed it. They finally fixed it after her report, after blood and photos and everything. Finally fixed it. Here's how they fixed it. Please look down when you get in the elevator. <laughs> they didn't actually fix the problem. God forbid. And I snapped a photo, because I'm like, that's InfoSec. <laughs> Gartner, Gartner, my favorite four quadrant folks, had a quote that said, 95% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault in 2020. <laughs> it's their fault. S3 buckets open, their fault. Bunch of credit card lovers leaked, their fault. Right? And, uh, and I read this, I'm like, ah, this, this is 
this reminds me of something because I'd read this book of design theory. So I'm look, looking and spending a lot of time looking at design these days. And they had this comment that industrial accidents, industrial accidents are caused by humans, right? Estimates range from 75 to 95%. Okay, that makes sense, up to 95%. How is it so many people are incompetent to book gas? And I was, it was at the bottom of the page. I'm like, yes, why are they so incompetent? Why can't we patch stupid? And I clicked to the next page. Click to the next page? Wow, do you do that in a book? That's terrible. All right, I clicked to the next page, and the top said, answer, they're not. <laughs> it's a design problem. Like, what are we doing, right? We build these security systems. People trip over them. We block access. We block usability. We allow people to click on stuff, and they're like, ha, ah, they're stupid. It's their fault. We've got to figure out better ways to get folks in because for every one of us, there's a thousand of them. How do we engage some of those folks to build a better security to tighten things down? Maybe we can scare them a little bit. That's one way, right? And the quintessential way you scare them, as we all know, is, is pen tests. We just do that pen test. We'll show them that there's a risk and we'll get budget. So I was uh, spending some time looking at pen tests and I found like the first pen test. I was at B-Sides Detroit earlier this year and I was asking people, when was the first pen test? And I got some great answers. All the young people are like, like 2010? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was around then. Some folks are like, 2001. Like, yeah, you're getting closer. 1995 when hackers came out. That was it, <laughs> right? Because they almost, the boat almost flipped and it was terrible. There would have been oil everywhere. And, What's cool about hackers, by the way, is the guy skateboarding through a data center. I can tell you, A, I'm not very good at skateboarding, but B, I had a data center, and C, you better damn well believe I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> don't try that. If you get nothing else, don't skateboard data centers, people. Um, 1998, when the Moore's worm hit and took down the internet, that's the other thing I heard. One thing that's fascinating about cybersecurity is we're so focused on this being a new discipline, a new domain, we oftentimes forget our history, and for oftentimes forget where we came from. We need some historians. Um, but I want to take you back to a time, it's 1967, that's not the first pen test, but 1967. Uh, All You Need Was Love was the song on the top of the charts. I pulled that record out the other day and listened to it, it was phenomenal. Summer of Love was happening, cars looked like this, computers looked like that, I'm not kidding, someone said it was a washing machine. No, that was where you put the hard drive, God damn it. Right. <laughs> computers looked like that. And Rand Corporation, got a bunch of people together. They threw the very first conference, the, the like kernel that grew into B-Sides Charleston in 1967. They got 15,000 people together. They said, hey, we're building all this stuff. Computers, networks, we're building all this stuff. You think it could be broken into? We know the answer today, right? We know the answer. But they launched the first pen test. It was by a na guy named James P. Anderson. I love it because he sounds like Neo, James P. Anderson. 1972. He published his results. J.P. Anderson today looks like this. I looked at Google. This is this is Stop making me feel old. But the first pen test was a phenomenal read because you read it, and for a while you forget you're reading history. It's like, here's our attack scenario. Here's what we're thinking could happen. Here's what the threat actors would do. And then you get to the point where they're talking about, and they could shuffle punch cards. You're like, holy hell, this is 1972. But we've been doing this pen test in the exact same way, right? Can it be breached? Well, yeah. Can we get funding? Okay. We've been doing this again and again and again since then. Sure, we made improvements. There's NIST. There's P-Test. Um, but we're so focused on pen tests on the weakness side. We forget the strengths. We forget to say, okay, break into this room. And they're like, we can break through that door, that door, that door. We forget to say, okay, where's the walls? And can you get through the walls? We forget to figure out how to build on those strengths and those core tenets. If you're testing that way, you test something like this. Does the control even exist? Seems silly, but I can tell you from experience, see, I was thinking it exists until you get to someone who goes, <laughs> that's funny. No, we haven't done that in five years. Um, is it effective? Does it actually like stop the bad guys? We're talking about Equifax earlier in the speaker lounge. Equifax had a uh, FireEye box. It was incredibly effective except for it wasn't looking at anything in their web farm, so when they got breached, didn't see a damn thing. All right, uh, can it be circumvented? And finally, is it operationalized? When you're doing these tests, does someone actually respond? Think back to that prevention detection, it looks something like this. This is testing your prevention, and the detection response is all about the operationalize. Different way of testing, a better way of testing. For 45 years, we've been doing the same thing, right? This goes back to a time where you couldn't trust politicians. So much has changed. 
Uh, <laughs> not going to touch that much further than that. But MASH was on, right? The Waltons were on. And at that point in time, the OG, James B. Anderson, did the first pen test. We've been doing this again and again and again. Not necessarily focusing on strengths, but always focusing on the weaknesses. The quickest path in is what pen tests show. So that's the problem. But I know what you guys are going to say, right? Well, we got to do that because, and this is the last one, and I'm going to wrap it up, we have to be right every time, but the bad guys only need to be right once. Hear that again and again, every single scary slide ever, right? Every single time we need to be right. But do we? Do we? If you've got a good attack path, right, and you've got controls along that, and you put a hell of a lot of monkeys on that, they've got to get past that guy, that guy, that guy, that guy and not be detected, and not ring any bells. And at that point in time, I'd argue, they have to be right a whole lot of times. They have to be right every single time along that path to really get in and steal the rhino horn or whatever their target is. So how do we do that? We do that by playing both games, by protecting the resources of the organization and preventing the criminals and mapping those up and realizing that we don't have a hell of a lot of visibility in either one. We're dealing with a lot of unknowns. The fog of war is the world of InfoSec today. We can study the criminal mind. We can get a better idea of their motivations, their tactics, by pulling in reports, by looking at the analysis folks do, um, by looking at our own environments. What happened the last time, and how can we stop that? We can skip building castles and instead focus on very flexible, very fast defenses that we put in place, and when none of those bells ring, we rip them back out taking a, a lesson from the Agile community where security is a feature that's rolled in really quick and rolled out just as quick if it's not used. We can check the checkbox where we need to, saving time in some other areas and spending time in, in where it counts to be bear compliant, but to raise it up where we actually need it. We can build weird things, which is what is exciting about InfoSec, embracing the obscurity when designing so we trip up the attackers, so we trip up the software, so we can come up with some really clever hacks, like embedding the registry keys for hypervisor and all your machines so malware shuts itself off. We can hire weird people, which is also what makes InfoSec exciting. Different people, right? Strange people to us. More diverse people who bring in different ideas and different ways of doing things. We can pen test strengths, right? We can build those defenses and hire those people and put them in the right place and then test to make sure those defenses are working, test to make sure people are responding, test to make sure that the right things are in the right place. Our assumptions are holding up. When they don't, we can improve those instead of just finding the quickest way in because we all know there's a million and one ways in our network because we don't have enough money and we don't have enough monkeys. These are some things we can do. Or don't, right? And this fundamentally, and I'm talking a lot to the young people right here, is my call to action to you guys. Don't. Break the rules, right? Think for yourselves. Find new ways to do these things. Argue with us all gray beards. Hack at yourself. Don't sit there and when someone hands you a bumper sticker that says, don't click shit, think that they're the rule, right? Don't be in school when someone says, build your defenses like a castle. They go, yes, I'll build. Maybe not. Maybe argue about that. Maybe challenge that status quo and come up with new and exciting ways to do things. Because for 45 years, we've been kind of doing it the same way. And it's about time to flip some tables. So I'll leave you with this thought. May the dumpster fire as they light. <laughs> 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 and I'm talking about those guys who follow the rules, right? The dumpster fires that are lit by people every day who try and over-engineer and overdo and push people away and not embrace true security and finding new clever ways. May the dumpster fire as they light, light your way. Thank you very much.